yellow is quite intense, and then green, quite intense, and then uh, indigo, and I believe there's violet, yeah, violet. So the only one we have is not have is orange. Sorry about that. <laughs> as, so, as a primary, you can generate it from a combination. You could do, but you want a pure orange, which I will, we will have. So when you can, you each each no, each color has its own separate knob. So I can mix, uh, which John of God's device cannot do. I can put green and violet, mix them, uh, like a different ratio or percentage, and I can add a bit of red. Uh, no, that's red. Yes. Yeah. And then a bit of violet. So we, we can add different colors because all of the lights are inside this probe. So this would be good for chakra work, really high, uh, high level chakra work. Do you want to show the pulsing? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Can you see what you yeah. um, okay. So this is low low frequency mm -hmm. pulsing. And now you can increase the frequency. You can increase the frequency through a whole wide range of frequencies. And then at this point you don't see what what they are. It seems to be con running continuously, but mm -hmm. it's a it's a high frequency, somewhere above fifty K I yeah, guess. So Although the high frequencies are going in, you, you, a human eye cannot perceive more than 32 pulses per second. Any more, any faster than the human eye cannot perceive the separate frames. That's why in movies we're all 32 frames per second, because the human eye fuses the frames together. So above that, some of the therapeutic frequencies are way above that. So that's uh, what we have here. And that brings up another point. I, on on your these devices, GSR devices, I have two frequency levels: a low and a high. I could put a variable control like this, so you can choose your own frequency, which could be important. So for a, for subsequent models, it's something to think about. Is that something you would want? Or just go with the frequencies we're using are well well chosen and they seem to work well. I'll find out. No, it seems to have got broken. No. Fortunately, I have another one. It seems to be working well with even without the light, so. So any questions about the use of crystal? A crystal uh, is stores information, it focuses it, and it raises the healing level to, to higher dimensions that I'm going to talk about shortly. These higher dimensions are the levels at which we want to work not of the lower dimensions of frequency. That's why I don't focus much on rates and frequencies because they're at a lower etheric level. So, uh, and crystal, yeah, one of the great crystal scientists, I did a workshop with Marcel Vogel, who was one of the great crystal scientists. There's another one in England, Oldfield, Harry Oldfield. He has a couple of books about electrocrystal therapy. So if you like, if you like, if you have a special uh, interest in crystals, get Harry Oldfield's book. I think you can get it on Amazon. What's it called again? Electro. Electro crystal therapy. Do you, do you want me to say a couple of things about my conclusions? On oh, this? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but what's his name again? Harry. Harry Oldfield. Harry. And with the other one, Vogel. Vogel, Marcel Vogel. Yes, Gaddy is going to. Um, I, I've done um, maybe a hundred uh, sample treatments with this device uh, on, on different willing subjects, anywhere from five minute sessions to half hour sessions. Um, I'm, I have experience with chapter work, so I really use this as an extension of my being 
working the chakras, right? So sending the appropriate colors to the the chakras to achieve certain results. Same as I would have done with my hands, but using this and experimenting with different um, frequencies to pulse the light. I don't usually use very low, you know, like um, epilepsy triggering kind of flickering, but um, I, I will doze on this and end up being in, um, somewhere at the top of the sound range, like 15k, 20k and, and above. Um, nine out of ten times people came back to me with extremely positive results, uh, either whether working on general well-being, relaxation, or working with some specific problems. So this is, uh, this is in its infancy, and as far as I see, um, it works directly on the on the um, auric body, not necessarily on organs. Having said this, a few intuitives um, told me exactly how to tune the device and what to point the device at, and they had good results with some physical ailments as well. So that's all I can say about this at this point. But um, we can achieve through the uh, these six I guess six primary colors. We can blend any of the 17 million available colors with reasonable accuracy. Mm -hmm. And and the place to experiment here is, is with the um, the vibration. The, the repetition, the vibrational on off, is that yeah, yeah, what you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the pulsing. Pulsing, yeah. The pulsing, which is the light coming, going on and off at a certain frequency, and that's not related to the actual frequency that the light is, right? So it's a separate element. There's also a way here to use um, John's patented uh, frequency modulation that goes from uh, very slow to very high and back to very slow. This is uh, another thing that um, yeah. needs to be explored. So you have that incorporated in many devices. Right? Yeah slow scanning so the, the machine automatically covers the whole range of frequencies that your client might might need and then when you hit a resonant point the client may feel something and say oh yeah that feels good that feels right so use the client's body <coughs> as a dowsing tool get feedback yeah. and, and also we have uh, a few different heads the, the uh, crystal head is inter interchangeable, so we, we have about four or five of them. Some are fine, you can use uh, you know, the same John of God, uh, Lumerian crystals if you, if you so choose. You have a couple of giant, huge crystals that achieve different results. Okay, we'll move on. I've just given you handouts. Uh, uh, what, what is, what are scalar waves? In, in doing this work, you'll come across sorry, sorry. you'll come across the term scalar waves, <laughs> and it's it's a it's a, a term that was coined by Tesla actually. Uh, he he felt that there were these waves that were pervading the universe, affecting it's like neutrinos. They go through matter and don't leave any residual change, but yet they affect matter in subtle ways, so he called them scalar waves. So it's important to know that scalar waves is also equivalent to many other energy forms that are used by scientists. See, they call it scalar waves, make it, make it sound scientific, and then it's more acceptable to the community. But uh, it's actually, uh, another term is morphic fields. It was coined by Rupert Sheldrake, the English professor. And he, his theory is that there are these fields, scalar waves, morphic fields, that impress matter and cause matter to take the shape and form that it does. And that's the word morphos. Morphic means shape in Greek. So these waves give rise to the shape and form and order that, that we see around us, including the, the flowers and the aromas and the perfumes and the poisons that are all part of biology. And we'll talk, we'll talk a bit more once we go on to the slideshow. 
And the other handout was, oh, yeah, a solfeggio. I think it was solfeggio frequency. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you can listen to, listen to them on YouTube. And what we're going to do now is the metaphysical part of the seminar uh, to separate it from the more physical, instrumental part. And the metaphysics is the theories and the philosophies behind all the work that we do. And I have a special interest in bringing science to spirituality and spirituality to science. So I mentioned the uh, uh, morphic fields that, that cause shape and form in the universe. So the question is, where is that information coming from? To getting downloaded, riding on the waves to, to impart information into material substances. And other names are zero-point energy. Zero-point energy meaning that energy which still remains at zero degrees temperature. So it's not, it's not vibrational, it's not heat. It's from another um, external source, a more cosmic source. No, zero. Absolute zero, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, this is the right one. This is the right one, thanks. So at minus 200 and something? Some, that's standard. right, yeah, that's right. All right. Yeah. So nothing moves, all vibration ceases at, at that. So there's no Brownian movement or anything like that. Except there's this zero point energy that's still present coming from the cosmos. Okay, this is the history of the universe. So I'm just focusing and moving things. Oh, okay. Uh, our understanding is that there was a big bang uh, down here at this point. And there was a big bang and an explosion of, of matter in, in the universe. And it's, it's still exploding, it's still expanding. And it's, it's downloading all this higher dimensional information that's that's telling it how to shape, how to form planets and galaxies, how to form molecules and DNA, DNA particularly. So DNA is a, a replica of what's up in the higher dimensions. So I have a, I have a question. What happened before the Big Bang? I often say, where was God before the Big Bang? <clears throat> or did God survive the Big Bang? Of course, that's a humorous um, question. The, the answer is that these higher dimensions have always existed and always will. They're totally above what's happening physically. A universe is coming and going physically uh, is somewhat irrelevant to what's going on at the higher, the higher etheric, the higher dimensional levels. Okay, what's the next, the next slide? Okay, then some of these shapes, there are five shapes that primarily form our, our universe, the five platonic solids, and uh, they can combine together to co create the complexity that we call the physical world and chemistry. Just with those five shapes, all combining together in, in, in unique ways, like an orchestra. That's one of the things about frequencies. You rarely find a single frequency. Uh, when you're doing frequency work, it, it's better to have frequencies changing. That's why I build scanning and it makes the frequency change up and down. It's more therapeutic. Okay. Next. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Any questions? The five platonic solids. They're all on Wikipedia. You have them all on my page. <laughs> and they're fundamental shapes in the universe. Yeah. Okay then, Gary. Yeah. Okay, the theory of parallel universes is, is that uh, uh, bubble, bubble universes are forming all the time. The, the birth of separate bubble universes. 
uh, making an infinite multiverse. So that's, this is a fairly accepted uh, theory by physicists now, that we've got um, universes uh, erupting and, and uh, expanding, bubbling, like, like, in a bubble, like in a bubble bath. Or branching off to different universes. <clears throat> so this is a fairly popular theory that there, there are these multiple parallel universes all happening uh, simultaneously. Okay, the next next slide. So this this is about being able to shift from one parallel universe to another. And this is what many shamanic healers can do. They can <coughs> shift themselves and the client to another parallel universe where, which has a more benign outcome, more, more healing. So instead of healing, it's actually uh, flipping you to another, jumping to another track, another universe. Is this what you call soul retrieval? Well, shift, the shift, shifting to another plane, parallel reality, into one that has no illness. Mm. Because there are all these different universes, some with tragic outcomes, some with benign outcomes, so you want to shift into uh, a beneficial universe. And sh we, we think that sh some shamans are able to do that, people like John of God, who's able to do remarkable healings and the Qigong masters. Okay, next, next slide. This is the, the layers, like an onion layer. This is the layers of the human energy field. The, there's the physical, there's the etheric, there's the astral, there's the mental, and the causal planes. So there's different, there's the physical, etheric, astral, mental, and causal body. And according to doc Dr. Tansley, he says, don't, don't work at these lower levels. Work at the causal plane level, the spiritual plane. So work from the highest level down, rather than from below up. He said it's, it's creating problems for yourself and for the client if you work at too low a level. This is why I have concerns about ac acupuncture, is working not quite at those levels, um, or, or frequencies and rates. They are, they are working more at the level of the etheric and astral. So I have a bit of concern about that. What level does the, like the, this colored therapy, what level is this working at? With color? Yeah. You're working at that. We're working at the causal level. Color and photon, biophotonics, right. is is a natural uh, emanation of cells, okay. like we know. So it's a very natural causal spiritual plane level to work with. So I think there's a great future in color therapy. Yeah. Such things like this. Okay. The causal plane is the level at which our higher self operates. So we want to get in touch with the higher self, because that's where true healing comes from. And the higher self knows what's best for us. And we'll, we'll bring the healing energy down, and it'll filtrate down through the lower levels and manifest as the healing that is necessary. Not everybody needs to be healed, because some people have to work out their problems and you may not have permission to heal them. You, in fact, you should ask, does, uh, do I have permission to, to, to heal this? Will this person heal? Do they have permission to heal? And sometimes you get no. They, they have to work through their issues, their karmic issues, or there are things they're avoiding that they should be taking care of. Because it's up to them. They have to do a lot of their own work. They can't just go and expect a therapist to do everything while they are... It's like uh, somebody who has lung cancer who's still smoking. Uh, they have to do the work on preparing themselves for the sacrament that we are providing. This is a sacramental 
the act that we are providing for them. Okay, next, uh, next slide. Uh. Okay, here's another model, uh, the same model, but, but easier to see. The physical plane, etheric, astral, the mental, and the spiritual or causal. Now, the mental plane is divided into three sections because this is for humans, because our mental life is so complex. We have a lower mental life, we have a middle mental life, and we have a higher mental life. The higher one is full of affirmations and positiveness and optimism. So we want to try and reside in our higher mental level, and thereby bringing down the, all the benefits of this superconscious of the causal plane, which is the next level. So if you're, if you're functioning or your client is functioning down at the lower mental level and they're, they're angry, f afraid, blaming, then they, they, can't, they can't reach up for healing from the causal plane. So there's sometimes a lot of preliminary work you have to do to get clients into that receptive state. You've got to get their thoughts, their attitudes, their opinions, their beliefs, so that they can believe that they can be healed. And that's the power of affirmation. Oh yeah, and down here is another metaphor that's used quite a lot, the octaves. Uh, octaves, uh, one octave to the other octave is twice the frequency, so as you go up, as you go up, the frequencies double and get higher and higher frequencies. Anybody have a question? So it seems that perhaps the whole universe is in this form, octave after octave after octave, as the frequencies go higher and higher and more and more complex. And we know that as, as frequencies become more complex, some very bizarre things happen. Anomalies start to happen. Look, look at just like egg, uh, in light, for example. What's the difference between red light and violet light? Big difference. Violet light will do damage. Red light won't. Why so, won't violet light do damage? It's, it's ultra, if it's ultraviolet, it can damage tissues and, and material substances. It's, it knocks out electrons. It's an oxidizing energy. It damages paint. That's why paint surfaces get all damaged with ultraviolet. So when you go higher in frequency, you've got a lot more energy that can do good or do harm. And as you know, going higher still, you have to x-rays. X-rays can do a lot of harm. They're very penetrating. So as you go higher and higher and higher, <clears throat> and each higher frequency is associated with a smaller wavelength. Like in quantum physics, the wavelength is around the size of an atom, which is uh, 0.1 nanometers, very, very small, but yet a very high frequency. And you get the, the, the very peculiar phenomena of quantum physics happen as you go to higher frequency. So you know about quantum physics where you get this action at a distance. Another one is tunneling. You've got a, an electron or an, a, a particle it would not normally be able to go through a barrier, but if it's a quantum particle, it, it, it can go through the barrier and appear on the other side. It's called tunneling. So there's some very bizarre things happen when you go up in frequency, and more and more. So the higher the frequency, like up to the Akashic Records, for example, that's why we get such bizarre um, effects and manifestations. Okay, next, what next slide. Sorry. What frequency are the patient records at? Oh, I, I'll show you. I have a slide for that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the answer is it's, a, it's over a wide range because they each have their different colors or benefits. You know, and the, Roman, the ancient Greeks called it, they called it the muses because the Akashic Records is giving, giving somebody uh, poetry, giving somebody music, giving uh, artists. Archimedes giving him mathematics. So they knew that there was all these frequency bandwidths coming down from somewhere. So that's the Akashic Records, but I have a slide for that. Okay, this is the chakras. And there seems to be two different chakra groups, the, the etheric and the astral. 
which makes sense because each is a different plane of consciousness. I don't think you need to bother too much about the difference, except that uh, the chakra goes right through to the back. So you might find that you're able to treat through the back better than just on the front. Like, like with this here, we might find that it's better to treat on, on the back. Yeah, yeah, I have. Absolutely. And, and, and likewise, and the, uh, the lowest chakra, it too needs attention and healing because it's the foundation of all of the chakras, the, the root chakra, is where Kundalini resides. You all, you've all heard of Kundalini, right? It's the coiled energy that sits down there that is supposed to be able to go up and vitalize all the other chakras, but in most of your clients that will not be the case. They will be, they will be shut down and their Kundalini energy will be flattened down to the lowest one or two levels. <coughs> Maybe down to the very lowest. So we don't even have sexual feelings because it's it's so they're so suppressed that their all their energy is in this in the lowest chakra. But the in Kundalini Yoga, which I used to take, uh, I think, uh, there's a group in Palmerston Avenue, Toronto. I used to go to for Kundalini uh, Yoga, and they they tell us that. When the, when the energy rises up through all of the chakras, it goes up into the pineal gland. And when that happens, it activates the pineal and you see light flashes, sometimes blue, sometimes white. And I, I once had to give a talk on the neurophysiology of Kundalini. Some of the author, like one author, Gopi Krishna, ended up in a psychiatric hospital because he, his Kundalini rose too fast and activated uh, uh, organs and uh, levels that prematurely. Another, um, Muktananda, writes about um, Kundalini. He, he said he could see a blue light when the energy got up into the pineal gland. Now, when you, and you, when you put the probe of the, my devices on your eye, you can see light flashes. So I don't know if that's the pineal or if it's just the retina. At this point, it's quite noticeable when you put the probe and stimulate, stimulate around the eye and close your eye. You can see the light flashes, phosphines. To the next slide. Okay, this is a, a subtle energy. It's what we're studying, and it's a bridge between. Uh, the current uh, current uh, science, scientific theories and all of these uh, effects that we can't we can no longer ignore because there's so many of them and the, the evidence is overwhelming about past lives for example I mean Dr. Stevenson wrote a book uh, maybe hundred years ago he, he interviewed 3,000 children who claim to have past life experiences this is in India and he he would interview the child, get all the details, and go and corroborate the information, where they lived, who their wife was, who their children were, and was able to corroborate and verify a lot of these thousands of, of children. So there's a lot of work has been done, a lot of evidence. Let me tell you what the consciousness effects. Oriental medicine, like Qi Kong, remote viewing, very popular. Distant healing, which we are doing. Dowsing, which we are doing. ESP, extrasensory perception. And that, that usually is for people who have that unusual endowed ability. Psychokinesis, you can make things move at a distance. Prayer, the Baxter effect. That's where uh, Dr. Baxter put a polygraph. He was a polygraphist for the CIA. And when he retired, he got the polygraph machine and put it on a plant to measure its responses. And lo and behold, much to his surprise, it was responding to prevailing emotions in the lab. And particularly when he thought of getting a match to burn one of the leaves, the, 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 the plant went off the scale, the polygraph went off the scales. It had picked up his intention. So that's the Baxter effect. Amazing, eh? So talk to your plants. <laughs> uh, gravity, uh, a levitation how the pyramids were built, 
with levitation, acupuncture, power of visualization, which we should be doing with our, our meditation, outer body experiences, near death experiences, EVP, I don't know what that is, so, no. mediumship, about channeling, a channeling. Is a, I have a great respect for some channeling, particularly when you, when you read it and it makes so much sense. It's not written from someone's mind. You can tell the difference between channeled information and somebody writing uh, a novel. I, I, are many of you into channeling? Like one of my favorite channels is uh, Cryon. Uh, electronic voice phenomena. Oh, electronic voice. Oh yeah, voices appear on a tape or sometimes on a TV. You get these voices coming through. Uh, uh, we earth energies, like uh, the, the ley lines and the pyramids throughout the world that will make a difference to our work. That's why there are ch uh, churches and temples built on hot spots of healing. And that's because it's been discovered that these, these areas, these locations have unusual subtle energy uh, capabilities. One of, my, one of my favorite is the church in Chartres, outside of Paris. I, I had the opportunity to visit Chartres many years ago, and I, didn't, I don't know why I was pushed in that direction. I was coming on my way, I went to Scotland for a holiday back home, and I was told to stop over in Paris. And when I was in Paris, I was told to get on a bus to Chartres. I'd never heard of it, so I got on the bus to Chartres, and I went there. And when I was at the cathedral in Chartres, I was told to get a photograph of the, the floor of the cathedral. The floor of the cathedral has a Chartres labyrinth, and I'd never heard of it before. So I got it. So now I, that's my favorite sacred geometry pattern. In fact, I think I have some free samples. Yeah, here we are. This is the Chartres Labyrinth. It's built into all of my devices, even my uh, colloidal silver generators. The energy goes through the labyrinth. And in so doing, you could pass, you could take one. You take a nice one, some are a little scratched. And I wanted to talk a bit about this. It has very unusual characteristics. It's not just a nice little pattern uh, channeled by uh, Hildegard von Bingen. I, uh, I brought Hildegard von Bingen channeled music and art and science. And the music she channeled is now on CD. You can buy CDs of Hildegard von Bingen's music. Hildegard von Bingen, B-I-N-G-E-N. -E now there's traffic behind you. Oh. Well, which reminds me, I want to take a, a photograph of some orbs, which we'll look at later. I think you have to have flash to get orbs. You know what orbs are? Yeah. Usually they, they hang around special people. Now the flash didn't go off. Oh yeah, there it is. So you need, it seems that you need the flash to get a reflection back from the orb. I've taken many pictures that have orbs in them. Yeah. I'll have another. Good. And we'll see who has orbs. Good, good. You better get in the picture. You might have orbs all around. All right, okay. Good.
Okay, so Hildegard von Bingen, she channeled this uh, during the design of the Chartres Cathedral. Uh, this was typical of her channelings, concentric circles. She often channeled concentric circles. And uh, she was a, a herbalist, physician, healer, and uh, it was a great woman in her time. She was also head of a convent, so she was a religious, she was a religious uh, cleric, clerical person. Okay, I think, uh, oh yeah, let's see what else is there, ghosts. John, your, your bag here is interfering. Uh, go, ghosts, you, uh, turn on TV any night of the week and you'll see a ghost uh, program, right? Have you ever tuned in at two or three in the morning? You can't sleep and you turn on the TV and yeah, there's a ghost program running. And yeah, because there are, there are, there does seem to be ghosts. The evidence is overwhelming for all of this stuff. Ghosts, levitation, teleportation, orbs, light effects, torsion technology, that's for py around pyramids and the higher existence of higher dimensions. So we could move on to the next slide. This is sacred geometry. Includes mathematical, like uh, the, the golden mean you know about the golden mean is pi. It's formed the basis of the pyramids. And then pi is also a sacred number. <clears throat> and then there are other sacred frequencies, the solfeggio frequencies, that, uh, <clears throat> that we use. So this, this uh, labyrinth that I passed out has healing properties. It, it's like a crystal. It will bring in pure uh, energy historically because it's, it's very ancient and carries with it a lot of healing energy. But if you look at it carefully now, <clears throat> you'll see there's something about it I want to point out. It's called the Mobius effect. You'll see that adjacent lines are going against each other. They're all no two lines are parallel to each other. They're all going against each other. <clears throat> and that's called the Mobius effect. And what happens is when you put energy through this, as I do in Colorado Silver, the energy goes into the water, but it invokes higher dimensional fre frequencies because the, the two lines, the magnetic fields cancel each other out because, the, because they're going in opposite direction. And this is how, uh, electricians have known this for 100 years. They, they, they wind a coil, it's non-inductive, it doesn't give rise to a magnetic field, so they wind it um, one one way and the other the other way, so the magnet, magnetism cancels out and they have a non-inductive inductor. So I think there's a lot of uh, future prospect in that kind of device. There's also the caduceus coil. The caduceus uh, is, uh, is uh, the, the, the coil where that is coiled snake. I think I have it on a. I have it on a next slide. Let's have a next slide. Now well, this is a pyramid. This one's made of fiberglass. You must not have metal in your pyramid if you're thinking of building a pyramid. You don't have metal. But the mere shape, the power of shape, is is uh, brings about. Anomalous experiences, healing people inside at different levels in the pyramid. You know a lot about pyramids. Uh. Uh -huh. um, okay. Here's what I did. This, this, is, this actually happened. Uh, I was working with a healer who was staying with us. And we were practicing creating a pyramid in our mind. And I had a client, a web design client, who came in with a... Um, a three-year-old who didn't sleep the night before, and she was uh, screaming, I want to go home, I want to go home. And I built a pyramid over her with the other healer. And within 
five seconds, after hours of, of crying, she stopped and started playing. So, having said this, there's a, a guy in Ontario, an Englishman, who built uh, a pyramid. And, um, and he basically used it to grow different types of produce. And he was, his yield was 36 times what his, uh, what his greenhouse used to, to uh, yield. 36 times. And he found out that uh, the bottom was uh, acidic, I think, the, center, the middle was um, uh, neutral, and the top was alkaline. So he knew he developed a system what to grow where. And um, he got phenomenal results. Um, this thing here, uh, people walk in there, they heal. Any substance that you put in here in this pyramid becomes uh, more potent. Um, the weather, it, it moderates the weather around it. There are less storms. It, this is all documented. So, the, and these are the qualities of any pyramid, any, anything that's shaped like a pyramid. Which uh, can help with <laughs> they say that the big one really uh, has a lot to do with the energy of the world, right? And I wouldn't doubt that. So that's all I can say. They're like chakras on the planet. You know the planet is called Gaia because it's thought to have a consciousness called Gaia. Okay, let's have the next slide. Flower of light. Another sacred geometry pattern, probably of equal importance to the uh, labyrinth. So there's a lot of intertwining circles and, and uh, ellipses, each with their own unique frequencies. Okay, ne next slide. And another one, another popular one, the Sri Yantra. <clears throat> this is uh, ancient Hindu uh, sacred geometry with these triangles in this pattern. It's three. It's important you know, you can recognize some of these things, like it's basic <clears throat> knowledge for our work. Okay, then ne next slide. Okay, this, this is a crop circle. And the crop circles have become more and more intricate and complex over the years. And here they, are, they have laid down, it's not a good picture, but they have laid down the Sri Yantra on the desert floor in Arizona, someplace like that. Oregon. Oregon, Oregon yeah. And it's uh, 13 miles long. So this is not something that humans could, could have uh, constructed. And when you, you talk about crop circles with skeptics, they say, oh, it's just the way the wind blows. <laughs> but they, they haven't seen some of the complex the crop circles that are. Well, unfortunately, there have been teenagers that have been caught doing them, as well as them occurring naturally. They have gone out and saw people out doing them as well. So. Yeah, uh, uh, but not this one. Eh? <laughs> But you can measure as well pregnancy of the plants or yeah. surrounding so keeping them. Yeah. <coughs> okay, let's move on to the next thing. <coughs> the Shahatra Labyrinth here. We can look at it more closely. See, because where the, the energy comes in here and then it goes around and then back here. So that alternate lines, the energy is going in opposite directions, so it cancels out. This is an example of a Mobius, Mobius coil. There's a lot of these now. Toronto has several. I was involved in helping set up one in High, High Park, behind the restaurant, up on the top of High Park. What was the purpose of it? What was the purpose of it? The purpose is to, to have more sacred geometry on the planet you to can, raise our vibrational frequency. You can walk through the one in the You can park. walk through it. Okay, that's another point. Where is, Where, the park? Where is it in High Park? Just, you know the hill behind the restaurant? Go up the little hill and then on the other side 
you'll see there's a flat area. So, what, what do people report from having visited it? I don't know. You don't know. Because uh, my friends like to go there, and mm -hmm. they feel the energy. They they hold different sacred ceremonies there. And she in Chartres, the how they used it was the priest would lead the congregation, and they would be chanting and singing their hymns, and they'd be slowly walking all around here, so that the whole the whole passion would become activated and energized because of that movement. You have to have movement to get full activation. John, who would have thought to ask for such a, a pattern to be put at Hyde Park? Who requisitioned it? Who? Who asked for that to be built at Hyde Park? It was just a group of us approached the Toronto Parks and asked for perm <coughs> permission. Okay, so it wasn't them asking you, it was you asking the park. Yeah, it was initiated by you. No. By no. your group. By a group. I was just a participant. I happened to live right next to Hyde Park. Right. In uh, Roncesvalles area yeah. at that time. Okay, next next slide. Oh, yeah, there that's that's a chapel in California somewhere. That's not the it's not the Chartres Cathedral. But they've done a nice job. And again, when the priest and the congregation walk around, they activate the labyrinth because of their movement. Uh, the flow of movement is a necessary part. Now, what you can do is if you get a pencil and follow it with your eye, follow it around, you're creating movement. And that, that can help focus your consciousness. Maybe the penny, open the third eye. Okay. Talking about the third eye, it remind, reminds me uh, with regard to Kundalini. What's the difference between Kundalini and Tantra? They're both bioenergies, bio bioenergetic. Uh, Kundalini is a very private, personal energy that rises up and, and um, elevates us. Tantra, tantric energy is that which is shared between two or more people. So the energy, so. Generally, you, to, to have tantric exercises or yoga, you have to be well, well kundaliniized. You've got to be well uh, developed with your kundalini energy, particularly up to the heart, at least. And then you can get heart-to-heart -heart connections. Is, is kundalini sexual energy? Kundalini, no. That's not, no, okay. not particularly. It might start off that way, because some, sometimes it has to start somewhere, somehow. And then it's elevated like to two higher refined levels. Okay, next, next slide. Yeah, this is the caduceus coil. You see how the, the coils wrap around each other in different directions? And it's the same principle, whereas the energy is going opposite, and in so doing, it it invokes the higher the higher dimensions. And Caduceus, that was the ancient healing uh, staff or geometry of ancient times. The Caduceus. So this has become the medical symbol. And this, the, me the medical profession has taken this over as a symbol of healing. Okay, next, next one. And here is a, an implementation of a form of caduceus coil on a cardboard tube. It is winding the coil loosely. Seems to be important at a certain angle. M many authors say that the angle has to be right between the, the different nodes. Uh, that angle has to be the right angle. So it has to be wound quite carefully. What, so, what is this used for? Well, it's a healing. It's, it's, you would apply it to somebody for healing purposes. It would be emitting higher dimensional healing energy. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you put um, any current for this? Y yes, you would. You would have to. Yeah. See that. 
this indicates that there's current flowing okay. through here. Yeah. Do you it make might be pulse pulsatile different frequencies? Have too. you built such a device? Or? I have. But I I didn't have the chance to try it out on people. Okay. So there's a wealth of possibilities waiting for us. Can you purchase something like that? Or like, can someone make it? Well, I can, I can make it. What do you make it with? What? What type of coil do you make it with? Oh, well, in this case, it's a cardboard tube. And it's not metal, so it might be wood or cardboard. So long as the, the coils are at the right angle to each other. What would you use? What would you make the coils from? The coil, the wire would be, say, copper wire, probably, or silver wire. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's something we might douse out to find out what would be better, because I don't know enough about it to, uh, to to make it in the best possible way. Okay, next uh, next slide. Here's another secret geometry from Kabbalah. They're called the sephirots, the ten sephirots. These are the <coughs> different levels in the universe, from the lowest, the physical level, up to intermediate levels and to the highest, the God level. So that was their depiction of the different hierarchies of levels in the universe. So where is the Akashic Records? Well, the Akashic records would be probably more of these higher levels that has stores all of the information, or, or even just here. Okay, ne next slide. This is this is from David Hawkins' book, Power Versus Force. And he, he worked out with, with uh, muscle testing and with his wife, he worked out this, these levels of, uh, of human functioning from the lowest people who are full of shame and guilt or down at level 20 and 30, ap apathy, grief, fear, up to uh, pride and anger. And that's, there's a sort of barrier that people get up to that level and they think they have succeeded in life, in the power struggle for survival. So anything below 200 is survival. Esther Hicks does something like that too, in one of her books. Mm -hmm. Can you have that in the printer? Yeah, that would be a great thing. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can email it to you. I don't have a copy. Well, the link will be emailed to you eventually. Yeah, this is easily found on on the internet. <laughs> yeah, David Hawkins, Power versus Force, uh, Levels of Consciousness, Map of Consciousness, and you'll find it. Yeah. I wanted to say something about this. This is a, an exponential scale. So it's not like 200 is 25 levels above 175, right? It's a multiple. It's a multiple of that. And and what he points out is that when you reside anywhere above uh, the blue line of 200, your effect on on the universe is is phenomenal. You, this is where Jesus at 1,000 can can lift. The whole the whole universe, but you, if you're you know you've taken this step to go from 175 to 200, you've also affected and lifted a whole bunch of um, people out of negativity just by make, taking a very small step because every one of these steps is exponential. <clears throat> Does that ring true for you, John? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it really is a it's a very empowering concept. So you don't need to go up very high. As long as you're moving up and you're somewhere above neutrality, you're doing great work. So how, how are you doing, Bridget? Are you... Uh, 
sticking around for a while, or do you have to? Um, I need to probably burn out of here by 4.30, the latest. And I've pretty much cleaned up. I've made it really easy. I can make a checklist for you. Mm. Great. Thank, thank you. As I said, I'm, uh, Bridget is my assistant, and unfortunately, I'm going to California in two weeks. Lucky Go ahead. For a month and a half. <laughs> oh, well, you're coming back. Well, yeah, but I, I'm sort of, you know, I don't know what's next after that. I, I might come back. I might end up flying somewhere else. Where are you going in California? Northern. Uh, it's near Eureka. I'll be in the Sequoia Forest. And oh. may I ask you what you do? I, I'm a professional house sitter. Oh, okay. So I'll be taking care of two cats, a very challenging 25-year-old man <laughs> who he, I'm actually related to him, but he needs a co-pilot while his parents are away because he's a little like my aunt. But really interesting person. So I'll just do that for a month and a half, and then I'll come back, or I'll fly somewhere else, or who knows what's next. Life is good. Life is good. I'm happy. I'm, I'm vibrating at joy right now. That's a good place. That's a wonderful place. Interestingly, when David Hawkins checked out Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, and Sigmund Freud was down at, uh, I think, level 400. But Carl Jung had gone away beyond him, which is why they had to separate. Uh, it's, it's toxic to be around somebody who's at a lower vibration than you. Really? Yeah. Well, I could have told that. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you functioning? Don't, don't, don't do it. Somebody who's significantly lower is a, a sponge and uh, will ah. suck you off and suck you dry. Mm -hmm. If they're not moving up, then you can't relate with them. But if you're aware, can't you bring them up? Not no. if, not no. if they're they 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 stuck <laughs> and they want to stay there. So they're it's like a codependency. I, I experienced um, being uh, in a room with someone who, who really brought me up. And that was really neat, because I don't think I was at joy then. I was an environmentalist, which I still am. But it, it, it's really great feeling when someone brings you up. So the, was he a master of some sort? She, she was a master? She uh, is actually sort of a famous uh, ex-doctor of Canada, uh, Ghislaine Longto. Um, she uh, she had her license stripped away from her because she wrote the medical mafia. She was a Quebec doctor. Yeah, I interviewed her and she is phenomenal. Vibrations coming off her. What's it? Uh, Ghislaine Longto. It's spelled G H I F. Well, she just goes by that now. She's dropped the rest of her name. G L A I F. No, G H I F. Is it just, yeah. If you typed in the medical mafia, you'll find her website. It's her sonic ratio, which I can't spell. Medical mafia? Yeah, but it's the first book she wrote. She's written several of them. Does she live somewhere in Canada or somewhere like that? No, strictly Quebec. Well, she's still in Canada. That's Rima Label. What? That's from Canada. Yeah, that's a what? different person. Very interesting, too. Yeah. By the way, speaking a lot about colloidal silver and Ebola, yeah. Dr. Label. Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, slide. Um, how do you know what, what, what level your vibe, is there a way to test that vibration of where you're at? Like if I wanted to know what level I was vibrating at presently so I can know this room is full of 200s. Nah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, you, you would have so to do it the way David Hawkins did. Okay. He, he had to use someone else's arm mm -hmm. and ch check, is it, a, is it above 200? Yes. Is it above 300? Yeah. Is it above 400? No. So he would refine the, the number that way. Using. Are you using your right now? Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. 
All right. Okay. Can you use your dowsing as well? You use, can you dowsing. use your pendulum? Can you use any form of dowsing, yeah. Dowsing. Yeah, okay. some, pe some people use this, <laughs> right? Yeah. This is a yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay, and, and when it falls apart, it's in there. So th this is David Hawkins here and his book. I used to go to workshops, video workshops of his here, here in Toronto. There was a study group, David Hawkins study group. Yeah, he came to... Okay, uh, next next slide. Okay, this is uh, kind of important. Let me hand out this. This is uh, the spectrum. A spectrum means a range of frequencies. From the lowest frequency and the lowest frequency and biggest dimensions up to the, the finest, smallest dimension or highest frequency. So one question you might have is, is there any intelligence in the universe? And the answer is yes. But the question is, where, where does the intelligence reside? Is there intelligence in a table or an object? Yes. yes. Is there spirit in any object or table? Yes. But it's not, it's not to a very high vibrational level unless you use it as a, an intention uh, uh, impregnated device. Then it raises it somewhat. But so that the intelligence of the universe is very low for these large objects. But as you get to smaller, like 10 to the minus 10 is um, the size of an atom. When you get down to atomic size, you start to get uh, quantum effects, which is the manifestation of intelligence working on, working on atoms. So it, it starts to get intelligence starts to be able to be channeled into uh, objects and, and uh, forms and entities and what I think this is my this is my theory that the Akasha is up here this is all the highest intelligence of the universe including emotional intelligence including love and joy all these higher functions I think reside for the most part up here. So if you were to say, where, where does God reside? Then you would have to say God resides for the most part around here, uh, but yet has little, little connection with tables and chairs and walls um, because of the, they are not very good transducers or receptors for the Akashic information. So this is called the Akasha, A-K-A-S-H, the Akash. This is where all the information, knowledge, and wisdom of the universe resides, including healing and music. So when Mozart was hearing the music, he was, he was tapping into some, some area here. He was getting the music when Tesla likewise was getting inventions he would be tapping into a slightly different color in in that spectrum and all the other great <coughs> mystics and uh, what's the word sages people who have unusual ability savon savon s-a-v-a-n-t they some savons have incredible superhuman abilities. There's one I followed, and I, I, he, he's an intelligent in, young Englishman, and he's so smart, and yet he's a savant. He's somewhat autistic, so autistic savant go together. So they're disabled in some way, but yet they have this great capacity. Maybe uh, Hawkins, Stephen Hawkins might be in that category also. So they have this superhuman ability 
in this narrow area. Now, uh, it might be interesting to watch some videos of uh, this boy, this English boy. Uh, I've forgotten his name now, but he's the one who, he was so phenomenal that the Mayo Clinic in the U.S. brought him over from England to have him recite pi oh. to 25,500 decimal places, and it's a random sequence. So he was able to do that in four hours, and the computers that were trying to do the calculation to better, they couldn't keep up with him, but it's a, it's a difficult calculation, division, calculations that even a computer can't do easily. So he got everyone right. And you can watch him on YouTube. Daniel Tammet? Daniel Tammet. T-A-M-M-E-T-T. -E -T. It's worth watching. And he wrote two books, both of which I bought to read, because I wanted to find out, is he memorizing this, or is he getting it as a download, a channel download? And I think the answer is both to some extent, but more of a download. Yeah, and he describes in his book how the download comes to him. The number, the next number comes as a shape. He says it's like walking in a valley and the next shape comes. And it's a, usually a grotesque you know, um, shape. And he, he can recognize that shape as being a number. Well, they say that sometimes we're downloading So, and he, 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 he's the kind of person, these savants can remember a whole telephone directory. Oh like they can read a telephone directory and then <clears throat> give you the, somebody's name and they'll give, they'll give you the phone number and the address. Did you see the guy in the helicopter? Which father was sick about it, and he they told him, and then after that, he stepped with him in the chamber, and they come back to Tarama, and he painted the whole city with all houses. Wow. So That's right. He, it was in Rome. Yeah, yeah. He was taken up in a helicopter. Did you see that? Yeah, and the funny thing was, when he drew the city of Rome, oh. he drew it, the clock tower had the time of day that, that he was up in the helicopter. So it's like a photographic memory these people have. So it's quite phenomenal, superhuman. There's no, no normal human being could, could do that kind of thing. Also another Daniel Tamet, you can watch him on YouTube. He walked up to a couple of men playing chess and they had all their chess pieces out, they were halfway through the game. And he looked at it and said, uh, look at the board, memorize it, and we'll see who gets it right. So they all memorized it and he, he swept the, the board clean. So the two men tried to put the pieces back to where they were and they couldn't. They couldn't remember where they were. But Daniel Tamak, who had never seen this game before, was able to put everyone back, every piece back in the right position. So it's just photographic memory. So, oh, let me, one more thing. You see down at the far left, minus 35. 10 to the minus 35 is thought to be the smallest uh, dimension in the universe. The Planck, the Planck dimension. What exists there? It, it, it's 10 to the minus 35, so uh, it's thought that there's nothing smaller than that. So it means that that's the highest frequency available to God. So is, does that mean God is not so almighty? Yeah. I mean, I think that's yeah. the level of which is in community with us. It's the same theory of black body radiation. Well, so I, I think that God chose not to be almighty to give us freedom of choice here, to create randomness. Randomness, not even God knows what's going to happen. Pure randomness is the, the gift that we have been given so that there's uncertainty. There's uncertainty in the universe. So maybe that's a part of the Big Bang when it, everything blew up. It's still trying, it's still blowing up and ultimately it may come back together again to a perfect crystal. And then 
uh, I had a channeling once many years ago where I channeled that experience that was God just before the Big Bang and it was a, a perfect crystal but there were a, a inclusions in the crystal thought forms that were uh, related to wanting to move having nowhere to go having no contrast of polarity no up and down no male and female no plus and minus so those thoughts agitated that perfect crystal and it blew it blew god blew it <laughs> Okay, I think that's the last one. Check and see. Oh, there he is. There he is. From Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. Now, in uh, as you, as I told you, the universes can proliferate into other universes, like a bunch of grapes. So let's have the next slide. Yeah, this is like a parallel universe. There's a bunch of grapes growing and growing and growing. And gr grapes are nourishing. So I think that, that the nourishment from our physical plane feeds back, feeds back to God. Uh, so let's see the next one. Yeah, there's... Feeding on the universes. Okay, ne next slide. Thank you. Oh, here's the orb. This is a this is a very good picture of an orb, and it, it's got a a granular, concentric, circular anatomy inside. So does that mean? What does that mean? It's just a, it's a combination of geometric forms that are able to download or interact with higher consciousness and have an intelligence. Orbs seem to have an intelligence. They, they will congregate around children and around animals. So they have, a, they have an intention, a direction, a purpose. And uh, they, they, ca they carry some kind of intelligence, just how much we don't know. But they're all around, they're all around us, particularly in a room like this. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, discarnate beings. A lot of this material you'll find on Coast to Coast on you know, 6.40 a.m. Uh, if you join as a member of Coast to Coast, which I have, you'll be able to download a lot of their very interesting archives of, of, the, of very serious scientists who are interviewed and who provide information about entities and uh, discarnate beings who have not yet arrived at a full realization of their higher purpose. And it accounts for a great portion of unbidden thoughts, emotions, forebodings, gloomy moods, Irritability. So many of your clients could be possessed by entities that are affecting them, possessed to varying degrees that are influencing them. Did you believe that? Yeah. 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 I think the evidence, uh, particularly when you watch the evidence on coast to coast and other things, there are negative influences. Is there, is there evil? Gary and I had many heated conversations. <laughs> is there evil in the universe? No. It depends on what you have mentioned before. I mean, there's black holes, right? Like, they recently apparently they discovered black holes and white holes and burners. So. Well, there has to be evil in order for any, anything mm -hmm. on, on another level to exist. So well, one can call it evil. Right. Just, right. Yeah. Yeah, like to say evil, but there, has to, there can't be light without darkness. There can't be darkness mm -hmm. without light. Duality, right? right? So it's the whole alchemy of that, right? There's what's above is below, what's below is above. So if there's not one, there can't, the other can't exist. See, I think that's a very limited metaphor when you say that uh, evil is just the absence of light. I think it goes beyond that. There's a, there's a whole dimension on the other side of that. And that metaphor is too simple. Uh, evil is defined by your intention. Just as good as defined by intention. Right. So light is defined by intention. I intend to, to seek the light. 
Uh, but the dark, and if I don't intend to seek the light, I just am neutral. Right. But if I intend to seek the dark, then that's evil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, why, that's why I think there is, there is evil. And there are entities, I think, that are <coughs> programmed to be evil, evil programmed is. for destructive purposes. Evil is without love, so any time that you have a purpose that is not mm -hmm. for the betterment or the kindness or the love towards anything, <coughs> Because some, some of you are sensitive to evil, <coughs> aren't, aren't you? you can sense you're in an evil presence. Many people can, they can sense a, a, an evil being or entity. Yeah. Yeah. Not in the, in the gods. My understanding was or is to go see everything perfect, whatever light, whatever darkness, just evolution, planning. No, I guess if you intended randomness, then this is evil as a possibility. So how do we deal with that? This slide has some answers that I thought you would want to know about. This slide is from a book by a colleague of mine, Dan Benor. Yeah. And uh, he says down here, B-E-N-O-R, B-E-N-O-R, -E and he's reporting on a science by Dr. Wickland, Dan. different techniques to yeah. convince obstinate yeah. spirits yeah. to relinquish possession yeah. of the subjects. Uh, with a mirror, he used a, a body with a mirror, revealed the spirit that it was not itself in the right body. Another was to use a, a charge of high voltage electricity, like this Tesla coil. And that seems to clear uh, or wipe clean the aura that the entities can't get a grip on the aura. But if there are somebody attracted the entity, it must be something in the, uh, in the soul embedded that the person would attract. There is always good force for that it would not exist for the body. So a pre predetermined purpose, and we come here with a certain plan, and a part of it is playing with the dark, possibly. Learning. Learning. Okay. So this is where something you might want to consider. If you feel you have somebody who has a, give me a call and I'll loan you my Tesla coil with high voltage energy. Feel it before you go, the Tesla device. And how the high voltage comes out and you, you can clean the aura with, with this auric scrubbing with this high energy electron shower. Do you sell them? They're, they're available. I don't make them because they're available, but I can get them. How much are they? Probably about $500. Mm -hmm. Not a lot. If you did that, then John, do you have something then that would protect from I think it's, it's wise to know what you're doing, really. 
Right. Yeah, so you don't I want to have a seat, Marie. Have a seat. Yeah. You want to protect yourself. That's a yeah, good point. Yeah. You can sit there. And the table, so you've got to be well protected, and those around you, well protected. Yeah. And so maybe it's not enough just to get rid of an entity because it's going to go somewhere else. To some other person. Well, maybe those entities need to learn as well what is right or wrong. So if you create someone to call a miasm, what well, would your... A miasm is perhaps similar in a way, but it's not so intense. A miasm is a predisposition to disease or misfortune. Yeah. Whereas an entity takes possession uh, and it's, uh, it's like it has its own consciousness and purpose. And I've met a few people who, and you can tell there's a big difference between a miasm, which is more personal, and an entity, which is uh, from Outside. alien. Yeah. Alien. Yeah. Okay, but that's still doesn't answer my question. How would you protect yourself from that? You could many different things, yeah. Or you could use incense. There are many, throughout history, there are many ways. Incense. Um, essential oils, uh, um, smudging, prayer, all sorts of jewelry. Any particular protect. essential oils? Well, so, some so oils are more protective than others. I like geranium myself. Geranium oil. There's, there's a great book, Gem Elixirs and Essential Oils, by, um, it's a channeled book. If you look up Gem Elixirs on the internet, you'll find this book. It's, a cha it's channeled information, Gem Elixirs. So the, the, the importance of putting gems in water and creating a, a, creating a, um, a remedy in the water from the gems. We have another, I think we have another slide. Yeah. Okay. On the topic of entities, uh, physicists now acknowledge that according to the laws of quantum physics, there has to be entities, which is an, an amazing uh, um, revelation. And the, they're called Boltzmann brains. B O L T Z M A N N Boltzmann brains, and they are coagulations of consciousness that are maybe may flee floating in the universe. So we probably have been Boltzmann's brains at some point in our history, or we've been orbs at some point in our early history as we evolved from a simpler, from a more simple form to our more complex form now. And the New Scientist magazine that I subscribe to had a whole article one, one month on Boltzmann brains. So we have to take it pretty seriously. Next, uh, next slide. Oh yeah, here's a bunch of orbs again. Of different sizes and shapes. We normally we humans cannot see orbs. I think some people can, but cat, cats seem to be able to see orbs. My cat, I have two cats, and I see them looking up and following some things all over the room. So I think they must be seeing orbs. Because it's quite definite they, they fix on some object and it's moving. And there have been on YouTube there are movies of orbs. You can watch them move. Uh, usually infrared, infrared movies. You can watch them move, and they congregate around children and animals. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's one of my favorite crop circles. One of the most complex. 
and see the symmetry and the reduplication is so perfect. Do you have a sense of how large this is? They're generally three or four hundred feet diameter. And where was this? This would probably be in England. But most countries in the world have had crop circles. And now they're appearing on beaches in Northern California, you see on YouTube. And that one on the desert in Oregon, where the Sri Yantra was there. So they're becoming more complex and they're becoming uh, on, on other media, like sand. Yeah. OK, is there another, another slide? OK, yeah. This is the color spectrum of energies produced by the simplest element in the universe. And the point of this is that even the simplest element, hydrogen, is producing all of these frequency, frequency lines. Some are very narrow and some are broader. But, but can you imagine what it's like, the frequencies that are coming from the Akasha? This is, this is simple. Uh, atomic physics, but from the Akasha, we've got billions and billions of frequencies and colors all coming down to create the order that we experience here, including our ideas and music. So that's the hydrogen spectrum. When you heat the hydrogen gas, it starts to emit all these frequencies, which are, are buried in the atom. Next slide. So another question, are animals conscious? Do animals have a soul? There's a movement now to make dolphins, to give them a person status. Yeah. Which I think is probably a good idea. Dolphins have some unusual abilities that we normal humans don't have. They're more like, like a like a savant. Uh, I watched this dolphins coming up and there was a, a pattern of um, ball, balls on a wall. And the dolphin would come up and see the number and tap out, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they go back down. And then they put another combination of balls and the dolphin would see it instantly and be able to tap out linearly the number. So only a savant, a human savant could do that. So in some ways, animals are, have superhuman abilities. You know, bees can see ultraviolet. Um, mosquitoes can sense ultrasound. So we have to honor and acknowledge that uh, there are other creatures that have intelligences that are surpass ours. Uh, ne next, next slide. And here are my. This is this is one of my two cats. Aww who is uh, hyper-intelligent, highly connected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I got these two cats when I was living with Gaddy in another house. So Gaddy knows this cat very well. Very well. Is that Tesla? No, this is Sufi. This is Sufi. So the next one. When, if I'm down for any reason, she'll cuddle with me until I'm OK. Oh. And this is my other cat, <laughs> Tesla. Wow. He's a male. Yeah. So next, next slide. Thank you. Oh, and horses, they're very intelligent too, aren't they? Yeah. And dogs, dogs and horses. All animals have their loving intelligence. See, what's the highest form of intelligence? Love. And animals, um, many, many animals you wouldn't think have that capacity, have great capacity for love and um, bonding. If you watch on, I watch some amazing videos on YouTube of a, a dog and a dolphin, a dog riding on the back of the dolphin, or uh, other cross species bonding and relation relating. Okay, the next next slide. There's one. Oh yeah, this is my pendant that has a shielding effect. A few have been asking, a few of you have been asking about it. This, this one has a rubber wheel around the end, so that's for men. It's to remind them of Canadian Tire. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, it has the, 
the labyrinth and the crystal and the coil. It has a coil here that uh, uh, produces scalar waves. So scalar waves are very important in our work. Okay, ne next slide. Oh yeah, um, the lady called Glenda Green, an artist, was visited by uh, Jesus, who uh, asked her to paint his portrait. And in the course of uh, doing so, they had multiple, many conversations that she wrote about in her book, Love Without End. So it's a, a and this is the portrait that uh, she painted. Yes, yes, 19, 1992. So there was a lot of revelations, just like in that other book by Neil Donald Walsh, Conversations with God. Oh, yeah. 